Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfi. If you enjoy this programming, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Join Truth and Rhythm's membership program through Patreon. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkandstuff.net. At that site, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome back to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership trumpet player Holly Ferris, best known for several decades of recording and performing with the godfather of soul, Mr. James Brown. First connecting with Brown in the mid-1970s and parting ways for a few years along the way, eventually became music director and continued working with Soul Brother No. 1 right up until his 2006 death. Among his other credits is playing with Steve Winwood and appearing in his 1989 music video, Roll With It. Doing it again because it felt so good the first time. Holly, thank you for once again joining the show. How are you? I'm good now. <laughs> <laughs> now that I figured out this, I don't know. No. I don't know if I said mentioned it before, but the first session I ever did with Brown, did I ever tell you that story? Uh I don't know that you did, but I certainly wanted to uh, get into some of that history. All right. You want to hear it? <laughs> <laughs> Lay it on me. Yeah. We uh, got hired by James and, and, uh, and the first session we did was in Criteria Studio in, in uh, Miami, Florida. And um, we're all sitting in the room, the whole band, which is not how you're supposed to record. And we're all just sitting around. He said, I don't want the bass player to play this, blah, 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 blah. And the drums play like a tighten up and a guitar play, you know, and he's just like giving out parts right there on the spot. And we're like trying to figure out some horn parts to fit in with it. He said, okay, roll a tape. We said, wait, what do you mean roll a tape? We haven't even rehearsed it yet. And he counted it off and we went into it. And that's the cut that came out on the record. <laughs> We absolutely did not know what was going on. I, I've never seen anything like it in my life. What and what what track was that? Get up off that thing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, that totally blew my mind because uh, you know that's just not the way you do it in the studio. It's everybody's got their own separate track, and you do rhythm section, and you do horns, and you do vocals, and then, you know, but not not that day. It was everything all at once. Ready, set, go. And that was about 75, 76, somewhere in there? 76, yes. Uh-huh. And, um, wow. So, <laughs> yeah, that's what we said. Wow. <laughs> what, what, was your, uh, what was your experience uh, before that? You know, uh, what types of things have you, had you done before James Brown? Well, I uh, majored in music in college, and uh, after... I graduated. I taught school for a minute and then I got drafted during the Vietnam war, but luckily I didn't have to go to Vietnam. And, um, I somehow, I don't know how I did it, but I got in the army band. So that was cool. And I played music the whole time I was in the army. And then I went back to college on the GI bill to get my master's. And then while I was working on my master's, 
a friend of mine said, man, well, I got this band I want to put together. Can you play trumpet? Yeah, sure. So we ended up, we were like the most popular band in the whole area. And we worked every weekend. And then at the end of the couple of years there, everybody was ready to do something else. And we just said, well, let's go to Nashville. So the whole band just packed up and went to Nashville. And uh, then after a few years of touring, we, we were getting ready to break up and we were playing at this club in Atlanta where James stayed when he was in Atlanta. And he came in, heard the band and uh, hired me on the spot. And then later on, I got our keyboard player and sax player with James. So all of a sudden there's three white guys Three Southern white guys with James Brown. So, what, what what type of material was your band playing that he top heard? 40, top yeah. 40 stuff, yeah. Uh, how well-versed were you in James Brown's material before then? Well, I'd always played James Brown music, you know, from the time I was in the first band. Oh, stop it. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, we knew it, but we didn't really know it. We just thought we knew it. And then once we got with him, we said, okay, yeah, this is a whole different thing. But, uh, yeah, we, uh, I, I knew some of his music, but all of a sudden, you know, there we were thrown in the deep end. <laughs> and then the first show we played was in Mexico city. Never forget this. And he comes out in a white jumpsuit and he starts doing the splits and the knee drops. And when he did knee drops, he came up and both, both of his knees were bloody. You can see the blood seeping through the, the white jumpsuit. And I thought, and that's the first show I did with him live. And I, I said, man, this guy is something else. He makes his knees bleed every night. <laughs> I said, that is really some showbiz right there. But it turns out that what happened was right before we left is he got in an argument with his wife and she got jumped in her car to leave. And, um, uh, he reached in the, the car and grabbed her by the hair and she rolled up the window on his arm and drug him down the driveway on his knees. <laughs> so that was how that came about. But I just thought, man, this guy makes his knees bleed every night. What a showman. <laughs> wow. What, um, did you have any trumpet, uh, uh, heroes or people that you tried to emulate? Yeah. Early on was Al Hurt, of course, you know, he was the big one. And uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie and, uh, yeah, guys like that. Uh, of course, Louis Armstrong. Yeah. Of course, I couldn't even begin to come up to their standard. But uh, I did get to hear Al Hurt at the New Orleans Jazz Festival before he died. And he was – they had to – help him up on stage he was in such bad health but he still played his tail off it was great it's funny because the cats musicians no matter how old they get they can still do it so i'm grateful for that because i'm getting up there too <laughs> so you had this uh, wild first uh, live experience this crazy first recording experience uh, did uh, any sense of normalcy sort of settle in and you got into sort of the pattern of the way things were going to go? Well, we just figured that we just got to roll with it, you know, flow, make, go with the flow. And uh, yeah, it was like air against everything. Cause all three of the guys, the white guys that, that I got that had joined the band were music majors. So, you know, we were studying correct, the correct way to do music. And James was not about correct. He was just about whatever sounded good, whatever felt good. That's all that mattered, you know, because he would get in arguments with the band and they'd say, oh, you can't play that chord. That's that's not that's not a proper chord. And he said, yes, sir, but how does it sound? And they said, well, it sounds all right. <laughs> and there you go. So he just violated all a bunch, a bunch of rules as far as music goes music theory and all that but uh yeah it was all about the groove for him and he made it work and created a different kind of music that to this day they're trying to duplicate to what extent did you just try to 
copy the records uh, versus kind of do some of your own arrangements and things like that? Um, a lot of times he would try to change up the songs, but we, we wanted him to stay with the original because that's what everybody, you know, had heard and knew. So, but uh, occasionally we'd do uh, a different arrangement of a song and um, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. When you came in, um, Holly, were there any legacy band members still around from earlier? Oh, yeah. Uh, Sinclair Pinckney, the saxophone tenor sax player. Uh, uh, Jimmy Nolan, guitar. Uh, Melvin Parker, drummer. They'd been there for years. Years and years, yeah. Yeah, those are veterans for sure. Did they give you any tips or advice? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just throw you in the water and you sink or swim, you know? That's what it was. But uh, yeah, we just barely missed out on uh, Fred Ma Fred and Maceo and Bootsy and all that crowd. They had like left right before I joined the band and I, I hated that I missed that. But uh, anyway, yeah, I ended up, we ended up doing, you know, they would come on and play, sit in with us and whatnot. And so we got to enjoy playing with them. But uh, yeah, they weren't part of the band when we were there. Was he still, uh, you know, handing out fines and things like that? Or had he moved past that with the band? Oh, yeah. He would still do that. He wasn't as severe about it as he used to be. But, uh, yeah, they said he used to come out, out on stage and he'd be doing his one foot slide across the stage. And he'd be looking at your shoes and he would go 5, 10, 15, 20. <laughs> if your shoes weren't shining. But, uh he didn't do that too much unless you were just really goofing off. And, uh, yeah, then he would get you. He sure would. Did you think, uh, what have I gotten myself into or were you just having fun? I did. I was like, help. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now? Yeah. It, yeah. It was, it was okay though. I mean, I, it was like a totally, totally different experience because like I said, it was just not, typical of, of a musician you know he, he did everything his way and that's it no other way or the highway what about though being up close to him in that way and you know what talent was really evident to you that he possessed what charisma and that sort of thing <laughs> well as far as the music goes he hear, he heard it in his head. He couldn't write it down. He couldn't even play it. Although he played a little bit of organ, but he could just kind of grunt, grunt out what he wanted you to play. And you had to kind of make sense out of it. And that's, that's the way it went. That was a lot of his sessions. A lot of his songs came out like that. You know, he would like come out with an idea and, and, uh, you just had to figure out how to make it work. And, uh, most times it did, you know, if it didn't feel right, he would fix it. He'd make it, he'd make it work. I used to rehearse the band, you know, I'd you know, rehearse certain songs and whatnot. And then he'd come to rehearsal and I said, well, I got it as good as I can get it. Now you need to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and he would say, that's right. I'm going to fix it. And then I'd give him his, his little thing there. So yeah, it was fun, fun stuff. Did he have a side to him that had a good sense of humor and that sort of thing? Or he was did. he always, he did. He really did. Uh, he wasn't always about, you know, business, but, uh, yeah, he could tell a joke and, uh, uh he's told some really off, <laughs> off color, not really off color jokes, but some jokes that's probably, uh, not politically correct. I should say, you want to hear one of them? Absolutely. <laughs> he said mr ferris he called everybody mr and mrs everybody as a sign of respect mr ferris you know how to starve a to death and i'm like oh man uh, no sir i don't he said hide his food stamps in his work boots i didn't know whether to laugh or not laugh you know it's like what do could i be do a test could be a test right <laughs> what do I do here? Oh my. 
<laughs> but yeah, he had he had a sense of humor. Sure did. Did yeah. you ever see him uh, make uh, many mistakes on stage? You know, no. Uh, toward the end of his career, though, he would, when he wasn't in good health, he would start to forget stuff, and uh, we'd cover for him. I mean, we we knew what was supposed to be coming next, and we'd go to it, and and he and he fall right on in there. But uh, yeah, he he mostly it was all about him. He knew exactly what was going on. And if you weren't watching him, he'd he'd call another song right in the middle of a, one song you know we'd be playing something and he'd call call something else bang and if you weren't looking you'd miss it there you go your 50 dollars fine or whatever well, what was the biggest mistake you ever did Woo, let's see <laughs> there's so many no <laughs> he, he never find me but uh yeah I, I, I didn't make any mistakes that were noticeable let's put it that way yeah and hit a sour note somewhere along the line i did but he didn't know it <laughs> <laughs> well that's the advantage of him being you know not technically sound musically so to speak yeah, that's true yeah did you get any solo spots or you just pretty much played oh, with yeah the, uh... yeah he used to bring me out and of, of all things he would make me dance Bring the white guy out, make him dance <laughs> with the king of dance. I mean, he invented all this stuff. Michael Jackson, Prince, they all took after James, James's dance steps, you know, and a million other people. But, um, yeah, he would bring me out and just, I don't know if he's trying to humiliate me or what, but <laughs> it was all in good fun. Hmm. And I had to, I had to learn how to dance. I had to. Uh, out of self-defense, you know, because uh, I, know, I couldn't get out there and just embarrass the whole white race. I couldn't do it. <laughs> Since you mentioned uh, Prince and Michael Jackson, were you? did you happen to be there that one night, that one show in the early 80s when uh, they both came on stage? Yes. Yes, that? that was unbelievable. Explain that to the viewers. Well, we were playing at Beverly Theater, I think it was, in Hollywood, and um, the opening act, B.B. King, come on. <laughs> I mean, really. And so B.B. played, and, and uh, then we started doing our set. And then uh, James said, well, we got somebody else in the audience. We'd like to bring up here Mr. Uh, Prince. So Prince came up there, and he, he uh, took our lead guitar player's guitar and started trying to play, and the, the guitar, <laughs> lead guitar player's pick was broken. And Prince couldn't, he couldn't do it. He just threw the pick down and handed off the guitar and left. It was funny. He just really got to do nothing. But uh, then he called Michael Jackson up there. Oh, man. Everybody went crazy. Yeah. And, um, of course, <laughs> Michael Jackson James kicked off into a fast song and Michael just busted down in his moonwalking and all that stuff. And everybody just went nuts. So it was like a star studded show that night. Prince, Michael Jackson, BB King. Come on. <laughs> it didn't get much better than that. that was yeah, I know. Prince didn't look great in that. There's like a really fuzzy video of it out there. Um, and, and yeah, Prince didn't come off well. It was hard to tell if he had a technical issue or he had an attitude issue or what was going on. Yeah, the pick was broken. Hmm. He couldn't play with a broken pick. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Almost like he was sabotaged. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. You... <laughs> it's true. So what was it like backstage? I mean, did Michael come backstage? I... No, he didn't. But he did come to some of the shows that we that James played and uh, came in the dressing room and I met him and all that stuff. And it's like, but matter of fact, the first show that he came to, uh, I'm not sure where it was in California, but he came in the dressing room, met James and then his handlers made him leave. They said, we got to go, Mike, we got to go. And he was like, Oh, please let me stay. He was, you know, and they had control of him at that time. So they didn't let him stay. 
But uh, later on, you know, he was like the king of king of the world. <laughs> he could do no wrong. Yeah, I know, and he obviously idolized James Brown. Yeah, yeah, he came to his funeral. Sure did. Yeah. I mean, Prince did too. You know, I know he saw James Brown. The uh, story goes when he was a little kid, and I think he. I've heard that he like even like got dancing on stage a little bit as a kid or something when James was playing a show back in the day. Oh, he might have been. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Michael's early early uh, songs and whatnot. He was doing t- totally James Brown moves. I mean, just you know, it's like a replica, <laughs> a little tiny replica. <laughs> And and Prince too, especially with all the splits. Oh yeah, well see. Okay, all right. Now this is my opinion, which means nothing. But doing all those splits, Prince hurt himself. He was in pain, a lot of pain, and that's why he was doing the drugs to kill the pain. Mm-hmm. Took him out. Took him out. I don't know Michael. I don't. He didn't do a lot of splits, but I mean, he had a lot of. Uh, physical issues i'm sure but uh yeah i think prince would just ruined himself yeah i don't know james never did stop doing splits right the the last year he was alive he was in the 70s he did the splits we were like oh my god (laughs) we couldn't believe it we really couldn't believe it that is incredible yeah yeah so, uh, Holly, in the, in the seventies, after get up off that thing, um, what records were you on? I have a list of them right here, but, um, were you on all of them or most of them or what from like the mid to late seventies? Most of them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't give you a name right off the top of my head, but, uh, if you have a list of them, I can tell I'll, you. I'll just, I'll just go through to verify because you know, the credits aren't on these records. No, so no. He never put credits. No. Yeah. So uh, I think it's it's great for fans to hear, you know, if you were on these. Um, Sex Machine Today. No. 75, okay. Um, Body Heat. Yes. Do you remember, uh, were you there when that title track was made? Because that's a later year classic for sure, Body Heat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was in there. I was playing it. And again, we're all gathered around a microphone. <laughs> it's like every everybody all at once, which you know you just don't. That's not the way you record, you know. But anyway, that's the way he did it. So he's all about the feel. If it felt good, great. There you go. Didn't care if there's mistakes. If you made a horrible mistake, it was on the record for all time. <laughs> so you're just there it was. Yeah, and that that album actually came out the same year as Get Up Off of That Thing. So two records in '76, and then '77 uh, was um, Mother's Nature. Yes, I played on that. Um, and then take a look at those cakes. Yes, played on that. And Jam 1980s. Yes, played on that. That had Spank on it, which was another really good later year yeah. track. Yeah. yeah, I played on that. Uh, then the original Disco Man. Yes, played on that. And um, after that, uh, he changed it a little bit. Soul Syndrome. I'm not sure about that one. Uh, I think I did. Yeah, I played on that one. But there was one song uh, album. I don't know if it was an album or just a song that was put out by another producer. Another, and uh, it was a. Uh, too funky in here. We oh, yeah. did not play on that. None of us played on that. That was studio musicians. And that was a great song, by the way, but I can't remember who wrote that and who produced it, but yeah. It was, yeah. That was definitely one of his um, later bigger hits. Um, and then uh, Into the 80s was Nonstop. Yep. And um, then he went to Scotty Brothers with Gravity. Um, that's like mid eighties. Actually, that jumped a few years. I didn't play on gravity. I was gone at that point. I think be- wasn't it before that he had living in America was like, I was gone at that point too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I missed out on that one, but yeah. yeah that so was, that was his biggest hit ever. So back then when you were participating in all those sessions, 
what was it like in terms of uh, the shows versus in the studio? Was it just, you know, one following the other or? In the studio? Well, when you're you're doing shows with them. Yeah. And then how would studio time be integrated with oh, the show schedule? He'd just call a couple of days and that's it. We're doing a whole album in two days. It never, t- it never took more than two or three days to do a whole entire album. At one point he was with Polydor and I think they would pay him so much for per album and he would just say, okay, I need some money. So I'll go in and just, we'll just cut an album and in three days, there you go. There's an album. <laughs> That's unheard of as well. Nobody does that. Some people work on an album for months, years, you know, not him. Did he have a song list going in or how were the songs generated? I guess he, a lot of times he would rework a song that he already had. And um, and sometimes he'd just, he'd come up with some funky groove and we'd just make a song out of that. So you never knew what to expect. And how much were those uh, new songs worked into the sets that you were performing? Uh, not too many of them, really. Yeah, we did uh, Body Heat and Jam, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure. Not not too many of them made it. Uh, too Funky in here, put that in there. Of course, Living in America, of course. But, uh, you know, his big deal was Sex Machine. That was the, the finale every night, was Sex Machine. Jam must have been fun to play. That's got just a real... It was, yeah. and, and yeah. He featured me on the album, played a solo, and he would make me play with one every night. If he didn't make me dance. <laughs> I'm sure you got a bonus for that. No, I didn't. But we played a show in Germany one time with the, the opening band was Incognito, which is a fantastic uh, English band. And uh, at the, on the last song, James got me and the trumpet player from the other band out there to solo and swap, swap fours, you know? And I mean, I had played the entire show and I was shot and uh, I played, a f- we swapped a few times and then it got to the point where I, I was done and I just handed my trumpet to one of the dancers and I just took off and did a flip <laughs> on stage because I had nothing else, nothing else to give. And he just thought that was fantastic. So I got a bonus for that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I, I, you're acrobatic too. Oh, well, I, I could do a flip. That's it. That's all I could do. <laughs> wow. Well, that rivals splits, I think. No, no, no. <laughs> I, if I did the splits, you'd have to call the uh, EMTs for sure. But uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I did get another bonus too one time when we played in. Uh, Tbilisi, Georgia, which was Russia at the time. And we set up on one side of this gigantic Olympic sized swimming pool. The stage was real high off the water and the audience was on the other side. So we played the show and well, before the show sound check, James would like walk up to the edge of the platform and he'd look down and it's a long way down. He's come back, and then finally he walks up to me and says, Mr. Ferris, if I jump in there, you going to jump in with me? I said, sure, Mr. Brown, of course. I'll be right behind you, which I knew he wasn't going to do it because he was terrified of water because he almost drowned when he was a kid. Mm-hmm. He hated water. He wouldn't even take a bath or a shower. Mm-hmm. He always took a bird bath in the sink. I mean, he was always clean. He never smelled, man. He was always always really clean but he would he was so scared of water so we're playing the show and gets to the last song sex machine and i thought he just kept getting closer to the edge of the stage and i thought he's gonna go he's gonna go jump out there in that swimming pool so i I took off my shoes and my coat and danged if he didn't do it he just jumped out there and started trying to swim across to the people well, he had, he was fully clothed, shoes and all. Of course, he started to sink like a rock. <laughs> and I went in right behind him. 
me and three or four other people went in with it, behind him and um, I, I helped, I grabbed him and started pulling him back to the shore till finally I went under. But uh, yeah. So for that, for saving his life, I got a $200 bonus. <laughs> 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 yeah. There you go. What on earth do you think possessed him to do that? <laughs> what? I'm sorry. What, you, what on earth do you think possessed him to do that? Well, uh, drugs. Mm. It's the only thing I can think of. Because if he was in his right mind, he never would have done that. What what year when you came in did did do you notice or feel like some you know drugs were part of that scene or did that happen later no, or not really he never even drank he wouldn't even drink they'd send him champagne to his room and he wouldn't drink it but he would smoke a joint and then a few years on down the road it became smoking a joint that was uh, laced with angel dust. And then from then on, it was like, oh, gosh, all bets are off. So you never knew what was going to happen. And, um, yeah, he handled it, though. I, you know, I, <laughs> I have to say, I did Angel Dust one time in my life and regretted it. And I thought I was going to die. And it was the worst experience of my life. He can handle it. He can smoke it. He called it gorilla because it made him feel like a gorilla. Mm -hmm. as strong as a gorilla you know it was like dang dude so yeah he had a whole different constitution than anybody else that i had ever known i mean he could go on stage sick or whatever didn't matter he'd do the show we played in brazil one time and he was on uh iv fluids and something else i forgot but he was <laughs> He was so sick, but he get out of bed. He got out of bed, pulled the IV out, went and did an hour and a half show, came back, put the IV back in. And it's like, how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, you know, I've gone on stage with a cold or something, but no, man, I'm, I'm, you know, he was like really, really sick. He was throwing up diarrhea and all that stuff. And yeah. But he had a show to do. And it wasn't about the money. It was never about the money. He had plenty of money. It was just that he committed to do a show. And there it was. He was going to do it no matter what. And I understand that he kind of expected that from his band. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. There was no excuses. <laughs> no. No excuse. Uh -uh. But you having been in the Army, though, probably at least got you somewhat prepped for that sort of thing, right? Yeah, a little bit because uh, you put yourself through stuff in the army and in basic and whatnot, and you just don't know how in the world you can do it, but you do it. You have to do it, you know? So that's, that's kind of the way it was with him. It's like, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to do this, but I'll give it a shot. And uh, yeah, that's the way it was for sure. Do you remember doing any uh, TV appearances with him? Any Soul Train or American oh, Bandstand? Or... I didn't do any Soul Train, but I did Midnight Special twice. We did uh, Johnny Carson. We did uh, Conan. We did, uh, I don't know, Letterman five times. And it was like, yeah, Letterman loved him. And, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, several other things as well, but specials and whatnot. But, yeah. It was great. At its peak, Holly, about how many shows during a year might you do? Probably close to 100. You know, at one point, he was working like almost every day. You know, of course, that's when he was in his like 30s. But uh, yeah, <clears throat> and eventually he started to slow down a little bit. But still, 100 shows for the amount of work, the amount of output that he gives out. You know, it's like, how does he do it? I don't know. I don't know how he does it. Yeah, it was incredible. At that point, when you came in the mid seventies, was he still going around in a private jet and that sort of thing or what? You know, I think, I think he had just given up his jet 
because that was probably one of the low points of his entire career. And that's when Maceo and Fred and all of them left. And uh, he'd been around so long that everybody had seen him that wanted to see him. And they just, you know, it was like, okay, we're ready for something new. And at that time, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire and, uh, you know, all those groups came out. And uh, he, just, he just, his popularity dropped off. I mean, you can't stay popular for forever. And he uh, had been around since the 50s. So, I mean, come on now. <laughs> so that's a, that's a pretty good run right there. But then the funny thing is, after about four or five years, he started to get popular again. So, you know, living in America, and then he got sent to prison, and then that, that made him popular. I don't know why, but <laughs> it did. Well, sometimes you appreciate something more when it's yeah. taken away, you know? Um, absence makes the heart grow fonder, that whole thing. There you go. Um, did he seem, uh, back in the uh, mid to late 70s, did he seem um, any animosity toward, like, those other groups that were doing well then? He didn't say much about it, but he did say that they were stealing from him. They stealing my stuff, which, I mean, in a way that was true, but in a way they did their own thing, you know. But uh, he did start the funk. You got to admit that he was the the creator of funk music, mm -hmm. so you, you can't take that away from him. But uh, he just opened up a whole new world for all these soul acts, and and uh, everybody, of course, everybody gives credit to him, you know, and a, a ten thousand samples of him and his music were used with you know rap music and whatnot and um he finally started getting paid for that yeah that must have that must have really irritated him for a while oh well. yeah sure yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's me they done stole me <laughs> was... and even the 70s i remember when um you know, like David Bowie doing fame and he did sort of his own version of that and uh, average white band. I think he was saying they were kind of ripping him off. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and they were sort of, but not, you know, they did their own thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just took what he started and went with it. Michael Jackson, Prince, you know, that's, they're, they're all got their start from him. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.